questions from the study? Anybody going to have any questions to ask at the end? Because remember, I'm, uh, I want to encourage everybody to, to bring questions. So raise your hand if you had a question. I'm not, we're not going to ask it now, but does anybody have one? Are we talking repentance? Yeah. Works and faith, or just well, we're going to see how long it takes me to. I, I thought, you know, we're videoing it, so we might wind up just letting those who are going to miss because they're out of school watch on the video and everybody else continue on. So, did you have a question about faith? Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I, probably we're just going to cover repentance tonight. I just don't know. How many people had trouble getting through both? Anybody? Have, okay. So that's the plan. We're gonna just do one a week. We'll do we'll do uh, repentance tonight, faith next week, and then all who are gonna miss uh, I was gonna say episodes. Uh, all who are gonna miss episodes because of uh, being out of school, we'll we'll put it online. So let's get going um, in repentance. As I try to do on most of these studies, I, I want to back up and look at the, the whole uh, biblical perspective on these subjects. And um, in order to do that with repentance, you really have to back up again to the beginning. And one of the most important things to understand is that we were made for interactive relationship with God. Adam was meant to walk with God. Eve was meant to walk with God. They were meant to have relationship with God and real creation with God. And that is, that is the foundation of understanding repentance. There was no repentance needed for Adam in the beginning, or Eve, right? They had fellowship with God, they had friendship with God and relationship with God, and that was just supposed to grow and increase. But of course, uh, Satan rebelled, as we talked about last week, and led humanity in rebellion to God. Um, and so... Evil behavior. I haven't seen the movie Noah. Has anybody seen Noah? I've been reading so much about oh. Noah. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard a lot of bad <laughs> things about it. But at any rate, one of the things you have to understand is that when you read Genesis three through eleven and you see the sinful behavior, the sinful behavior comes from the root of moving away from relationship with God, and that's the key. All sin starts in separating, in mankind separating from relationship with God. Um, we'll say it again and again, the most fundamental sin is not trusting God and not walking in relationship with Him, in, is turning from that fellowship. Um, let me read a quote. Uh, I love this quote by uh, C.S. Lewis. He says, Now what was the sort of hole man had got himself into? He tried to set up on his own to behave as if he belonged to himself. In other words, fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. Laying down your arms, surrendering, saying you're sorry, realizing that you have been on the wrong track and getting ready to start life over again from the ground floor, that is the only way out of our hold. This process of surrender, this movement full astern, is what Christians call repentance. So I like the way he puts it, we tried to set up on our own, uh, apart from God. And this is the fundamental rebellion from which every individual sin flows. So God starts over. He starts over, most importantly, with Abraham. And again, God calls this one man, and we see over about ten chapters of Genesis, God just developing his relationship with Abraham. And Abraham learning to trust God, Abraham learning to obey God, uh, Abraham growing in trust in God. Um, so Abraham is called back to the relationship with God like Adam was supposed to have, one of trusting obedience. Of course, there's a lot of remedial work that Abraham had to do because of sin, but that is what he had. And God, God's intention was to build a nation with that one guy, to say, all right, Abraham, you and Sarah walk with me, you have kids, and you teach each generation to walk with me and in that fellowship. And that nation was supposed to teach the world how to walk with God, how to be in relationship with God. Um, but they only, well, they did that pretty poorly. Moments here and there uh, of individuals who got it in various ways. Um, but ultimately, 
uh, they wound up in slavery again because they really never learned to walk with God in obedience and trust in a daily way. And so the prophets come, and the prophets' primary message is repentance. Right? The prophets' primary message is, you've turned from relationship with God, and we are calling you back. And their most consistent image for that was of the, the image of adultery. They were calling Israel as a wife uh, who had left her husband back into fellowship with him, back to be restored. That is the most consistent. I mean, they use a lot of images, but that of adultery and a restoration is the most common image they use. Um, now, it's always important in the Bible to find when the first time a word or an idea is used. And it's really interesting, the first time that repentance is used um, in any of the ways the word appears is all the way in 1 Kings. Okay, I was actually a little surprised about this when I first saw it. It's way later. Um, so it's actually worth reading that. So 1 Kings chapter 8... <laughs> This is um, Solomon, as he is finished building his temple, um, and he's praying for the at the dedication of the temple. Um, and there's a long prayer. We're not going to read the whole prayer, but we are going to read this one part where he mentions um, where he mentions <laughs> repentance. So it's First Kings chapter eight, and starting in verse forty six. So he's praying about future generations of the people of God. If they sin against you, for there is none who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far or near, yet if they turn in their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive, and repent, and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned, and have acted perversely and wickedly, if they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place their prayers and their plea and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive that they may have compassion on them. Now, <clears throat> it's worth noting that that's exactly what happened to them, right? Yeah. That people later began to worship other gods, they began to not trust God, and they were sent into captivity. And it was in slavery, in a foreign nation, that they turned to God. Um, Jeremiah says, the prophet Jeremiah says, You shall seek me and you shall find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. That is a great picture of repentance. <laughs> but the, the thing I want to point out about this First Kings passage is that it is, once again, in the context of this is the people called to walk with you, God. And if they turn from that, and you bring the consequences that are always there when we turn to idols, uh, which is death and captivity, <clears throat> but if they see it, and if they cry out, and if they really turn to you, then hear their prayer and forgive them. Um, so it's one of the most, that is one of the, sort of lays the groundwork for an understanding of repentance in the Old Testament. Um, and of course Jesus comes and the prophets promise that Jesus is going to come and bring about a repentance uh, that is uh, a full repentance, to, and an, an ability to turn to God and have a restoration of relationship. Um, unlike even, um, unlike even uh, Adam was capable of. Um, all right, let me discuss just if, uh, some of the words. Some of this is in the study. Um, the Old Testament word for repentance uh, is a concrete physical analogy. It's, it's an about face, right? And I think a lot of people are familiar with that, uh, that understanding. It is to turn. You're going one way, you stop, and you turn, and you go the other way. Um, and I think it's important to note that the image there is of direction, right? You are headed in one direction, and you stop and you make an about face and you begin heading in the other direction. Uh, it's, not just a, it's not just a static thing, but it is a progress in one direction and now turning in a progress in the other direction. 
The New Testament word adds another dimension because this word has to do with a change in the way you think. All right, it's not just, a lot of times if you look up the definition, it says a change of mind. And that's okay, but it, that sort of says, well, you were going to have a hamburger and you decided to have a hot dog. It's not that kind of change of mind. It is a total change in the way you think of everything, all right? So Paul will talk in terms of you need to have your minds renewed. Um, you need to change the way you see everything, not just stop particular sins, but see the way you change every, see the or change the way you see everything in life. Um, a good example of the way this word is used is in Romans chapter 12, or this idea of an entire change of how you look at life. Um, Romans chapter 12, starting in 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable, acceptable and perfect. So he talks about being transformed by the renewal of your mind. And he goes on to talk about, he says, you need to change what your, your whole attitude about what you're for, what God is for. And he begins to unpack this idea that you are for loving other people. You are for offering yourself to God and letting Him take you and give you as a gift to love other people. And that's a change, a total change in the way you see life. So repentance is, um, yes, it's a change of mind, but it is a change of your whole, I'll use this expression, strategy for the way you live, the way you look at all of life. Um, the Holy Spirit comes to bring about that total change. Um, so that's the New Testament word. And I like that the Old Testament word has an image. You know, it's a turning. But that New Testament word is like you have rose-colored glasses. You can take them on and you get a whole different set of glasses. Um, again, a great example is Paul. Paul can say later, listen, I was well-intentioned. I thought I was serving God. Uh, but I found out, not only was I not serving God, but I was actually opposing Him. And that moment on the Damascus Road and the, the subsequent time after that brought about a total change in the way Paul saw everything, right? Mm -hmm. He learned to see what other people saw as defeat as actually God's victory. Weakness is strength. So repentance initiates a total change of mind. Um, let me talk, let me give what I, some four pieces of repentance. And none of these can be separated, but it's nice to talk about them individually. I mean, they all have to go together. You take them apart, it's like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, so the first thing is the context of relationship with God. We have to understand that all of us were created for that, um, that every person we meet was created for that, and if they are in a place where they're not in living relationship with God, they need to come to repentance. They need to turn from that and learn uh, to walk in life. Um, and we need, to get, we need to get a sense of that in our hearts. My greatest sin, whatever other sins I committed, my greatest sin was just saying, I'm going to do my own thing apart from God. That was the greatest evil I participated in. Um, a second component of repentance in the Bible is the revelation that the Holy Spirit brings of that state. Right? The revelation, uh, sort of the information, but it's much more than information. Um, it is knowing with God's help the brokenness, the sin that you're a part of, uh, that, you, that, you, uh, that is in you. Um, I share this story all the time. Maybe I've already shared it. Have I shared the G.K. Chesterton so there's a, in England, G.K. Chesterton was a Christian writer of a couple, or a hundred years ago, and somebody invited letters to the editor, and they said, uh, write to the editor and tell us what you think, what's wrong with the world. And G.K. Chesterton wrote a letter, and he says, as to the question of what is wrong with the world, I am. Yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, it was a great... It was a great insight. He was saying, listen, we can talk about all these problems out there, but until we each individually understand that in God's eyes, our sin 
and our separation from Him is the gravest evil, uh, we can't get a start towards understanding all those things. Um, so that's, that component is the Holy Spirit helping us see ourselves and see where we stand with God. Um, a third component is kind of an emotional component. I call it anti-self-esteem. Um, and I'll put it this way. If your primary concern is self-esteem, is feeling good about yourself, you won't be able to begin to repent. Right? Um, the sorrow that true repentance brings is a sorrow that can recognize the things that are so wrong with us and say, you know what, God, whatever you need to do, I see it. I don't want to. I don't want to pretty it up. I don't want to try to make it look better than it is. I want to see it for what it is. Um, I want to admit it. Um, this is a this is a a grief for causing God grief. Uh, this sorrow, this emotional component that the Holy Spirit brings, is not sorrow for how bad things have gone for you, but sorrow at causing God grief. Does that make sense? Um, that's a very important understanding of it. And then finally, and this is maybe the most important component, is the turning of the will to God. All right, is our hearts. And when I use the word heart, I mean our center, our will. I don't mean our emotions. I mean our inner yes. Um, I talk about this when I talk to my kids. You know, when you are working with children and training them and trying to get them to do what you, know, you want, you know when you have their hearts and you know when you don't. You know when inside of them is a yes to you and you know when inside of them, outside there's a compliance, but inside they're standing up. And what God our Father wants is an inside yes from us. And that is the, that is the heart of repentance, is God, yes, 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 yes to Him. Um, and it is a, a deliberate decision of the heart. Many people feel bad about the consequences of sin. Not as many people choose to turn fully to God and let Him lead them out of it. Um, and that's a very important thing to understand. Um, now, included in that, Many, many people feel bad for the consequences of sin. Much fewer people actually turn to God in their hearts and say, help me out of this. Um, Eric always asks me to say things again, and I don't know what I just said a lot of times. So it's, it's, I, it's kind of hard. Um, now, when that is there, all the results of our independence from God will be repented of too. Attitudes, particular sins, actions, habits. Um, that'll all flow out of that. Um, Alright, so maybe one of the most important things to understand about repentance is in the New Testament for the early church, Christians expected to see a clear evident change in someone's life. It did not mean that due to repentance they were immediately uh, just like Jesus, but it did mean that there was a noticeable, uh, a noticeable change. So I want to share some scriptures that just illustrate this idea that there was actual uh, people could look, and you know, hopefully you've had experiences of that of that in your own life or seen other people that you went, wow, something is different, something has changed. Um, so Luke three eight. Uh, this is John the Baptist in the beginning. He says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Now the point there is that, Abra is that John was saying, listen, you guys are relying on the fact that you are descendants of those who had relationship with God. You can't do that. You can't inherit relationship with God genetically. And John was coming against anything that people rely on other than real, real relationship with God that changes the life. In other words, if you rely on a religious experience you had when you were 10, if you rely on certain church institutions, if you rely on anything other than living active trust in God that bears fruit in a changed life, 
you're not relying on what God is looking for, right? You're not trusting God. Um, so that's John in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. And then in the end of the book of Acts, 26 20, uh, Paul is talking about what he has done in his ministry, and he says, um, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Uh, so he said, so again, hit Paul's summary of his message was that people should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance living lives actively that were different and were a result of active trust in God. Um, and then over in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, starting in verse 9, Paul says this, and this list is pretty important. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And notice what he says next. And such were some of you. All right. For Paul, that repentance had brought about a specific change in these things. It was a fundamental turning of the heart to God but it had brought about a change. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So for the early church, that noticeable change, it didn't mean people didn't have weaknesses or places they needed to grow, but there was a definite change that repentance brought. And minus that change, the question that had to be asked, is that real repentance, right? Because real repentance will bear a certain kind of fruit. Um, 2 Corinthians 7.10 Godly grief re produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Um, I think a good example of worldly grief is sadness for the consequences of sin, but not necessarily a turning to God. Right. So for example... Somebody could be sad that their alcoholism has ruined their body and destroyed their marriage. But they may not be sad that they have disobeyed God and lived independently of Him. And it may not result in a real turning to Him, right? Um, so that's a good example of worldly grief. It's a sadness of what I have lost because of sin, but not necessarily uh, a desire to turn to God. Um... Let me give a few of the biblical pictures of repentance that I think are pretty powerful pictures. Um, and then I have a few odds and ends, and then we can, um, we can uh, see if there's any questions or, or discussion. Um, one of the better pictures in the New Testament is of the prodigal son. I think most people know that story. Um, and again, it keeps with our original understanding of repentance. Here was a guy who had relationship with his father. He was supposed to have, right? He was supposed to be walking um, with his dad, working with his dad, loving his dad, trusting his dad. And he just said, you know what? I want what's coming to me when you die, and I'm leaving. Um, and when he came to his senses, he said, what have I done? Look at my life. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back to my dad in relationship with him. And he leaves the place where he was. All right? It's a great picture of repentance because he had gone somewhere and he came to his senses and he left that place. And he went back home. Um, so that is a great New Testament picture. And then again, um, the Old Testament picture. I can't stress how often, again, this theme of the unfaithful bride comes up. Um, many of the prophets use the image. Um, Jesus, when he was ministering, warns about that adulterous generation. In other words, it was, it was this whole generation that were, they were to be the bride of God and they turned from God. Um, and so maybe the most vivid in the Old Testament is again the prophet Hosea, right? The prophet Hosea is called to marry a woman that he seems to know will be unfaithful to him. She is on multiple occasions. Part of the power of that story is that Hosea lived with the shame of that in a place where everyone would have seen it, right? 
he lived, he experienced this woman leaving him and shaming him again and again. And God, in many ways, was trying to get Hosea to see what he had gone through with his people, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes to rescue her on more than one occasion and call her back to faithfully staying with him. Um, so God seems to, to hold that very dear. And then it, it has all the more meaning, by the way, for us as the church when you look to the New Testament, when he says, look, marriage is about the church and Christ, right? Um, and whenever the Bible, whenever Jesus talks about divorce, you need to keep in mind that what's in the background is God's understanding of his relationship with his people, right? That's something deeper in the background there. Um, so there's an Old Testament picture, not the only one, but uh, a pretty powerful one, and the New Testament one of the prodigal. Um, let's see. I, I, think, uh, I think, let me just mention one more thing. The, some of the books that use repentance the most, uh, that speak of repentance the most in the Bible are Luke and Acts. Okay, the the book of L Luke Acts is two books, but it, well, it's one book in two parts. Uh, it mentions repentance the most, um, and then Revelation. Uh, and it's interesting when you look at some of the passages in Revelation. Let me just give one or two examples. Um, when he's speaking to the church in Ephesus, he says in Revelation 2, 5, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works that you did at first. If not, it will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Um, okay. That's, um, that's the majority of what I had to share. I have a few quotes that I might read, but before I do that, let's see if there's not some questions or discussion we can get going. So, uh, what do we got by way of comment or question or discussion? When you said you had four pieces of repentance, yeah. Well, uh, can you repeat the first one? Yeah, the context of relationship with God. Um, well, context of relationship with God. Uh, a sort of a mental recognition of where we are that comes from the Holy Spirit. Um, a sorrow. Uh, a sorrow at what we have done to God, uh, and then a turning of the will. <laughs> and that, he and likes that point. That first one, the context of relationship with God is what you said in the very beginning. Right. That we have separated ourselves and not trusted Him. Yep. Yep. The, yeah, the first point is simply that that understanding that we were meant to walk in relationship with God. And that we that people always again like like John the Baptist was getting on to that generation because they were relying on the fact that they were descendants of Abraham. Mm -hmm. It is, I think, a sinful tendency to always look for a substitute for living a relationship with God that you can rely on. Mm -hmm. That's easier and it costs less. Mm -hmm. um, and that substitute, again, you know, if you had a Baptist background, it may be that you went through walking down the aisle and getting baptized when you were 10. If you're Catholic, it may be going to Mass regularly or what confession. It, people have various ways they do it, but there is no substitute for living relationship with God, trusting, obedient relationship with God. Um, Erica. The definition you gave for worldly grief, would that be the same thing that you would describe as false repentance? Yeah, I think so. Or, I mean, maybe just to add that false repentance doesn't result in the fruit that, that John was t talking about. It doesn't result in a changed life. Yeah. Yeah. What else? What other thoughts? Why in this study is repentance put after salvation? Just because in, in Hebrews 6 it's listed? Well, so salvation isn't really mentioned in Hebrews 6. Salvation is, uh, we're going to call the whole package of what we're talking about. Okay. And now these six sections that okay. we're going through are zeroing in. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, did everybody hear that question and the answer? So the question was, why, why is salvation, well, how did you put it? 
why is repentance put after salvation in this study? Right. Why is salvation put, or repentance put after salvation? And the point is that um, we're looking at sort of, if you will, pieces of the whole package of salvation. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. What else? Sins of omission. And um, let's see. James 4.17. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of what's the context of that verse? I mean, you know. Well, I'm sorry. I guess I'm thinking of uh, the verse that says, whatever is not done in faith is sin. You know, and you just, how far do you take that? Like, you know, brushing your teeth or? <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I think anything that is not done from a confidence that God would have me do this, and I don't think he's, yeah, you know, I don't think he's talking about, but if you do anything with a question, I don't know if God would want me to do this. I think that's what he's talking about. Again, I think if we look at, we'll talk about this next week, but faith is a relational word. And uh, my life lived in faith is a trust that I'm living, I want to pursue God's will, I want to do the things He wants me to do. And if I am doing a thing and I really have a fundamental question about whether He wants me doing it, I'm not doing it in faith. I'm not doing it in trusting relationship with, with Him. I'm doing it in a kind of, well, He can have everything but this. Uh, and so no, I wouldn't say brushing our teeth, but... Uh, I think it would be a lot of things, a lot more than a lot of people would would think about. Um, so I don't know if that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. What else? Man, first night we had a lot more commentary. Nobody else. <laughs> I got kind of one. Right. If um, someone is walking and seeking God's righteousness, and uh, they repented, and then you know they backslide, if you will, and, and you can count it a, a single uh, event or <coughs> several events. In that event, during that time, if it's even a calculatable time, are they not righteous? That's a good question. Are they not? Yeah. Um, I think what I would say is that God is a father. He's not an accountant. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I think God relates to us as a father, and He looks at the direction of our life. Uh, he obviously knows a lot more about us than we do. And I don't think he works on a clipboard, pen in hand, oh, you're, you know, you're headed this way, but I think he looks at the, the direction of our lives. Um, and so I, I guess just a brief answer is I don't think God as a father works quite kind of with the checklist in mind. I think he works with an understanding of where we're headed, what direction we're going in. Um, that being said, I don't think we should be flippant about right. being in disobedience, but I think God relates to us as a father. You know, I think that question is a great question. I think it comes up a lot when you emphasize the biblical teaching that if we walk with God, there's real changes that happen in our lives. Um, but I think it's also important to note he relates to us as a father, uh, not as a statistic. I don't know. I don't know a better way to put that. Um, and he's interested in how we respond even if we fall. Um, you know, maybe a great example to me would be um, in the Gospels, Jesus makes it clear again, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. And Peter not only does it once, but three times, and Jesus knew ahead of time. And Jesus says, listen, after you've been restored... So there's a sense that Jesus had a big picture of what was going on. Uh, and he was relating to Peter, both knowing what he was capable of, but also knowing what he was going to do to restore him and what was going to come after that. So I think uh, that's the best way I can answer, is that we need to, that all of us need to learn to relate to, to God as Father who is working in our lives to make us like Jesus. And that's a long process. But the primary question for us every day when our heads hit the pillow is, Father, did I, 
is there anything you need to talk to me about today that I need to make right with you before I go to sleep? Um, to keep that, you know, that's when Paul talks about, um, t tells Timothy about okay. keep your conscience clear. Because some who haven't kept their conscience clear have made shipwreck of their faith. So it's not that it's not possible to make shipwreck of your faith. It's just that I don't think God operates on a, on a statistical basis. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. All right, one more thought or question before we pray. Yes. Um, do, is every bad guy, if they repent, do they still go to heaven? If they really repent, yeah. So they, what if they're in jail, they repent? Well, so Jesus was on the cross, and remember there were two thieves crucified on either side of him. One was crucified because he was a bad guy. He had done bad things. And he asked Jesus to forgive him, and Jesus said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So that's a good example. He was, not only was he in jail, but he was dying for the evil thing that he did, and Jesus forgave him because he was repenting. So yeah, that's a great question. All right, anything else before we wrap it up? So next week we'll do Faith Towards God. Um, yeah, any questions? Can you, can you just comment on uh, how to counsel somebody in the sense of true repentance comes from God? I always, I always have a hard time, you know, I should, if I'm in a state where I really am wanting to repent, or maybe I just don't feel it, or but there is a sense that I should be asking God for that repentant heart, um, that I should ask Him to show me maybe... Uh, one way I would put it is, when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, in part what he's saying is, God is forgiving you. Therefore, you ought to turn toward him fully. Part of what it means that the kingdom is coming to us is, we don't deserve to be a part of what God is doing. But he's making it available to us, so the natural response is to turn to him. Um, I, I think that... Now, I don't know if this is what you're saying. I think a lot of people, sometimes people are looking for an emotional moment to repent. And I think the thing that God is most interested in is the will. So I would compare it to forgiveness. A lot of people know that God wants them to forgive, and they try to wait until emotionally they feel like forgiving. But forgiveness is a choice of the will, right? Forgiveness is saying to God, God, if you gave me the chance to judge that person, I would say I forgive them. If it was in my hands before you, I forgive them. And we rely on the emotions to come in line with that. Um, and I think I would say the same thing about repentance. I don't think, certainly, well... I think the Holy Spirit's convicting people all the time. Uh, I think God has made is willing to forgive people. So I think all the circumstances are there, and I think people need to make a decision. That's the most important thing is, all right, I'm making, I'm making a decision to restructure my whole life now, to turn from independence and to turn to God. I don't know if that helps. I, I do think that is a discussion. I think a lot of people sometimes are looking for some kind of emotional moment. A lot of times there is. Uh, but I think the most important thing is knowing they need to and making the choice to do it. You furrowed your brow like... No, no, I'm, I'm I guess just wrapping my head around the... That to me sounds more like it's... I mean, I understand it's my decision, but it's... Is it a gift of God? Absolutely. Yeah. That it I is, would even... You know, I the I don't know exactly how to. I don't I, want to say it's it's out of my hands. If I'm going to repent, God's going to make me. You know. That's, no. Yeah. That's not what I mean. No, but, no. I, but that He okay. draws me to that, and I should pray to be drawn to that as an attitude, not as a one time. Right. But that I would have an attitude of repentance as a Christian. Yeah. That I would see myself and want to turn to God continually, uh, over and over. Yeah. No, I think absolutely the scriptural teaching is that. He, he, the whole context of our lives, He is making repentance possible, right? I mean, everything about our lives, you know, the Scripture makes it clear. He has structured and done everything to make it possible for us to repent. Um, you know, we wouldn't still be alive if He didn't want us to repent, right? I mean, judgment could have been much swifter than that. So, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, um, let's pray. 
Lord, we just want to acknowledge that it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. Uh, Lord, that you made us for the greatest treasure, which is walking in fellowship with you and your Son in the Holy Spirit, and that we, in various ways, walked away from that, uh, turned that down. Uh, but Lord, in your patience, in your kindness, in your generosity, uh, Lord, you have extended the invitation again at great cost, at the cost of the cross, uh, to, to bring us back into fellowship with you. And Lord, I just pray that, um, that you would grant us full repentance, God, not a worldly repentance. Uh, and Lord, that you would really, in our midst, let there be conviction. Lord, in our congregations, that when people come, they would not just want to improve their lives or maybe get a little religion, but God, they would have a real clear sense of their state before you and of your free invitation to come and return to fellowship with you. God, I pray that our lives of walking with you would generate that conviction by your Holy Spirit in our midst. Uh, God, we just lift up the churches and ask that we would be a people of repentance, um, a people who can explain repentance in words and with our lives, uh, and that have a real power of the Holy Spirit that, that flows in us and around us to convict the world of sin. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we don't have to rely on our own, um, our own words or wisdom to convict people, but you are at work in people's hearts. Uh, and we just, we just thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.